let's see. Today I'm going to cover um, navigation in single page applications. And all of these examples are available to you at this URL. So if you go to this URL right here, you get this <clears throat> GitHub page. So I'm going to first discuss some background and then go through some code examples that illustrate what I'm talking about. So navigation in single page applications. A single page application means it's one page and it doesn't refresh. People when they make their first web page typically use multiple different pages uh, that, that have a lot of repeated content between them. But an alternative way to do it is have one page that just loads the content based on what you click. So these single page applications load the data using XML HTTP request. This is AJAX, also called AJAX. So if you look at the Wikipedia page for AJAX, uh, the Wikipedia page is really interesting. It has some history and various technologies that have been used. And uh, when you use libraries like jQuery or Angular that do AJAX, all they do is create this XML HTTP request object and fetch the data on the page. There's also this related concept of server-side push, which is kind of a more modern version of AJAX. And this is relevant for things like uh, chat applications. Like imagine the Gmail chat window. You know, if somebody else sends you a message, that's not the typical AJAX flow, where your page is requesting something. So server-side push is when notifications come down from the server and update you about something. And there are a few different ways to do this, where you make make an XML HTTP request, and then the server just doesn't respond until something is ready. This is called Comet. And then WebSocket is a new standard that does this. Socket.io is a really nice node.js library for this, in case you're curious. So with single page applications, the fragment identifier is typically used for navigation. The fragment identifier means the part of the URL after the hash symbol. So if you change the part of the URL after the hash, the page doesn't reload. Like on this page, if I put a hash something, I hit enter, it doesn't reload the page. But this triggers an event in the browser called hash change. And JavaScript can listen for that event. And also when you load the page, JavaScript can tell what that value is when you first load the page. So this is the core mechanism that people use for uh, navigation in single page applications. This is also called routing. In uh, libraries, routing is the, is, the, is the term that's used. So I want to point out that uh, there are many libraries out there, like uh, Backbone, Angular, Knockout, and Ember are some of the top ones. And these are full application frameworks for single page applications. And they do a lot of this work for you. But in this lecture, I'm not going to discuss any libraries. I'm going to show you how to do it with the DOM API, just the straight JavaScript, HTML5, and CSS. So I'd like to spend just a minute on workflow. So I've, I've noticed that a lot of students still don't have a proper workflow going. If you are SSHing into the CS servers and editing your code through SSH, like, I'm talking to you. <laughs> you know, that's not the way you should be doing development. You know, the development should be on your own machine because there's a, a lot of headache involved with doing all your development over SSH. You know, you have to wait. Like, when you type the key, you have to wait a second sometimes for it to, like, update. So you need, you need a proper editor or an IDE on your machine. Um, and you need to be aware of whether that editor inserts tab or space characters. And people are still doing this. This has been a, a persistent issue since the beginning of the semester. Mixed tabs and spaces causes indentation errors that are editor specific, that depend on how you look at the code. So for example, my Vim configuration uses two spaces to represent a tab. And the Chrome source code view uses eight spaces to represent a tab. So that means if you indent with tabs only, that's fine. If you indent with spaces only, that's fine. But if you indent some lines with tabs and other lines with spaces, it may look right in one editor. 
you know, one viewer, but all the other ones, it'll look, it'll look wrong. Um, in Vim, if you just want to do this once, you can open up Vim, set the tab stop to be four characters or two or eight, depending on what your editor uses, and then hit uh, colon retab. That will replace all the tabs with spaces, and then write the file. And also this uh, code mirror visible tabs demo is really nice for seeing the tabs. If you're not sure if your file has mixed tabs and spaces or not, you can paste your code into here and it represents tabs as these little arrows. So if you have spaces instead, you can see like, oh, there's a tab and there's a space. And this happens too. I see this in people's code. The same line has tabs and spaces. So just something to be aware of. So about navigation interfaces. Uh, WordPress blogs are perhaps, a, you know, one of, one of the best examples of this. WordPress is a blogging framework in PHP. And it has, <clears throat> you know, hundreds or maybe thousands of blogs that people have created with it. And so if you click on any random one, chances are it has some kind of a navigation interface. So if you click home, it goes to the blog where you have all the posts going down. And then if you click on about, notice how the URL changes. This actually reloads. It, it loads a completely new HTML page. And it has just one page on it, you know, about, whatever that is. So if you look at uh, some other WordPress examples, you see the same pattern over and over again. Here's a navigation bar that has many different links. And the home is, again, the blog with, with the posts. And then when you click on something like this, paintings, uh, that's just a, a static page and downloads as another static page. And the way this is working is the URL is changing and it's fetching the HTML over and over and over and over and over again. So even though in the code there's no repetition of the navigation bar, like the navigation bar logic is probably in one PHP file somewhere, but if you um, look at this DOM, like all these links, for each of the pages, all of these links are on each page. So that means when you click on one of them, it loads a different page, and the browser has to parse that same HTML again and render it exactly the same again. So the browser is doing more work, and the user, you know, and it's transferring more data than necessary. And the user needs to wait long, a longer time than if you did it on just a single page. So now I'm going to d discuss some approaches to making these navigation interfaces. And this kind of uh, foreshadows the code examples. So you could have separate HTML pages. Uh, PHP applications do this a lot. It used to be like a standard practice. And this was the initial design of the web. Like the, the, in the early days of the web, this was the way to do it. This was the way to make web pages. But in modern times, it's been replaced by this idea of a single page application. So a single page application is just one HTML page, and as you navigate, it doesn't reload pages. It doesn't load more pages. It just loads data. Um, dynamic behavior is added using JavaScript, you know, where, where you can get access to the DOM element and set the content. And the content is fetched as needed using XML HTTP requests. And routing. So routing is like how you, how you uh, keep track of what page you're on is done using a fragment identifier. And this is, this is still kind of the best practice. But there's a new thing that you should be aware of called the HTML5 history API. And there's this big, uh, nice article about it. And with this API, you can call uh, this function push state. Yeah, history.push state. And this will actually change the URL without using the hash. Like, it'll, it'll change the real core part of the URL, but it won't refresh the page. So it's something to be aware of, aware of. It's a new technology for this. But I won't be covering that. I'll just be covering the fragment identifier usage. And then there's uh, the issue of caching. So if you fetch some piece of data for a page, say, and then you navigate to another page, you fetch some other data, and then you navigate back to the first page that you are on. 
you know, a naive implementation would fetch the same data again. That's the simple implementation. But in order to make it more efficient, because you already fetched the data once, there's no need to fetch it again. You know, you could just keep that data that you fetched the first time. So that's called caching, and we'll do this in the code examples too. So that's kind of the, the background. Now I'll dive into the code examples. Here are the examples. <clears throat> so we'll start out with a basic page. So here's a very basic page. It's just an HTML you know, page with a title and everything. And in the body, you have three A elements. And this is not complete HTML code. When you have an A element, you need an href also. But the question is, what should the href be? And this is like the, the deep question of the day. So one option is to have many separate HTML pages. And then the other option is to have a single page. And also, how should these be styled? You can use CSS to make these look like navigation buttons. So we'll have a home, about, and a contact page. So the first approach is to have different pages. And I just want to show you how this looks. And this is you know, how, how most people approach making a first website. So here's the index page. The navigation links actually go to different pages. And index.html serves as the home page. So when you click home, it goes to index.html. And this is the, the home page content, you know, some text right here. But then when you click on about, it loads this page, which has all the same, all the same repeated HTML at the top for the navigation except this, uh, the title changed, so now it includes about. But then the text is different for the about page. And then there's a contact page with, again, the repeated navigation links, and then the different content for that page. So the next example has a little bit of CSS to style the links. So see, we, now they have a different background color, say. But I just wanted to show you how this is done. Um, the links are wrapped in a div, and this is kind of a standard practice if you want to apply CSS to a group of things, so we'll just wrap them in a div and give the div an ID or a class. So now this div has an ID of navbar, and then in the CSS we can select the navbar using the, uh, the hash symbol to select the ID, and then space A means, you know, select all the A elements that are descendants of that div. So this selection selects all the A elements, all the links. And it just makes their background color light gray. But uh, I want to show you that if I click on About, oh, now the CSS is not there. And if I click on Contact, it's not there. But if I click on Home, it's there again. And this just illustrates a, uh, a maintenance issue of organizing your site like this. And in general, it's not good to have repeated code. but if you want to you know, change something, it's, it's a very easy mistake to change it on one page and not the others. So on the other pages, I didn't update the other pages. So it's just a, an example of one mistake that you could make. So in this next example, the CSS is taken out of the style tag. In the previous example, it was just right in the HTML page as a style tag. But in this next example, it's included as a separate uh, style sheet on all the pages. So now if you click on them, it works. But again, like with this organization, you have to go and make this change on every single page. And it's kind of a, it's a headache, you know? If you have a website that's organized like this and you want to make a change to the navigation bar, you have to go and change all the files, which is just not good, you know? You could organize it differently. And, like, and you could make it into like a PHP app or something, where the navigation logic is in one source file in the PHP, which is how PHP applications work usually. Uh, but even this is not the best approach because the browser is doing more work than it needs to. It's fetching the navigation bar HTML every time. And I want to point out, and 
I wasn't aware of this, but then I just Googled it. I was looking at this little piece of code, type equals text slash CSS, and I was like, well, is that really necessary? That seems like a little, I don't know, verbose, a little bit too much. So I Googled it, and sure enough, this property is uh, not required in HTML5. It's required in HTML4, but it's not required in HTML5. So I just wanted to let you know. You can just remove that, so it makes your code a little bit shorter, a little bit more clear. So next I'm going to talk about the issue of highlighting the navigation link that you're currently on. So see how the home link is darker right now? I'll make this a little bit bigger too. Now if I click on about, the about link is a little bit darker and contact and so on. So this is still using the same approach of multiple pages, but it's setting the active class on the link that you're currently on. And this is kind of a standard practice. You would see this, this class, this active class, a lot around the web you know, for this purpose, like Bootstrap uses it as a standard term. So on the home, on the home page, that class is only on the home link. And on the about page, that the active class is only on the about link. And the same for the contact page. And this is the CSS that makes the currently active link gray. It uses the dot to select the active class and then just makes the background color gray. This is the expanded version of the structure that we'll create dynamically later on. So later on we'll use the same active class but we'll use JavaScript to change it on the fly rather than have it inside the HTML. So here the CSS is different. It looks more like buttons, maybe a little more elegant, because this, this previous one was like just the simplest possible CSS. So in this example, I just changed the CSS so that it looks a little bit nicer. Uh, for example, using a Google font. Google fonts, if you're not aware, are really nice. It's a really nice way to use fonts in your CSS. And it has this nice page where you can try out a bunch of different fonts and you can type like whatever text you want and it'll preview that. And then you can uh, click one of these links. Forgot which one, but this one I think. Quick use. And then you can just uh, copy and paste this little piece of CSS into your CSS and then add the font family to whatever thing you want to style. This is how Google Fonts work. So using a Google Font uh, right here, I'm assigning the font family based on the Google Font. Uh, changing the size, changing the margin, the padding. And uh, for a while I didn't really know what, what the difference was between margin and padding. So I just want to show you. So if I click on this link it'll run full screen. And then I can click on uh, Inspect Element. And by the way, this is a tool that all of you should be using. The DOM Inspector, a lot of people just don't know. But uh, you can right click on something on the page and click Inspect Element, like this. And uh, it'll bring up the DOM structure, the Document Object Model structure that's actually loaded right now on the page. So right now this is the same as the HTML code that I had. But if JavaScript changes the DOM, you'll see the updated changes. So this is a way of debugging your JavaScript that creates DOM elements and stuff. And uh, over here, if you click on Computed, Chrome has this really nice feature where it shows you the box model. This is the CSS box model. And if you hover over each one, it, sh it highlights on the page where that is. So this is the, the main, like the, the center of content. This is the padding. See, I added the padding to the sides uh, so that the circle wouldn't overlap the text. So that's the padding. It's like outside the text. And then there's the border, which is between the padding and the margin. And then there's the margin, which adds space in between the elements. So the margin is really outside of 
the element, it's, it adds space in between. But the padding is sort of inside the element. It's inside the border, at least. So in this next example, yeah, question? How did you get the round borders? Exactly? Oh, yeah, yeah. Board? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't finish uh, <laughs> going through the CSS. So I added the marching and the padding. I changed the color to be black, which is not the default color for links. Text, dec text decoration none means there's no underline. So it doesn't really look like a link. Uh, a border of two pixels solid adds the black border. Um, and the border color is white by default, but then when you hover over it, it's black. And when it has the active class, the border is gray. And the reason why the border is round like that is because of the border radius property. Border radius uh, specifies the radius like from here to here of the rounded edges. And because that value is about half of the, of the height of the elements, it appears like a circle. That's why. That, so that's how that's happening. So that's all for the CSS. Uh, the rest of this will be all about um, implementing single page navigation. So in this next example, example eight, we change the links. So now there's only index.html. There's not the other pages there. CSS is the same. And the navigation links now go to these uh, fragments. So if you click on home, it goes to, you know, uh, hash home. If you click on about, it goes to hash about. So right now, if I run this full screen, I show the URL bar. If I click on home, it's the full URL, but then it's just hash home at the end. Now, if I click on about, it changes it to hash about. And notice it does not refresh the page. It only changes that ending part of the URL. But nothing happens. You know, this is the bare bones basic uh, way of doing it. But what I did is I just changed the href to be the fragments. So once we have this, we can uh, listen for those events in, using JavaScript. So here there's some JavaScript on the page. And location.hash. See, here's a link to the... Um, W3Schools location hash page. This is the property that has the value of that fragment identifier after the hash. And location.hash actually includes the hash symbol. So you need to get rid of that with a substring operation. But this is how you can access the value of that. It's location.hash. So this line of code here just logs the location hash to the console. So if I run this full screen, open up the console. See, it doesn't print anything because there's no location hash. But if I type something like the hash value and hit enter, it will uh, print that out, the hash value, including the hash symbol. And then there's this event on the window called hash change. So again, window, window is the, like the global object in JavaScript. Is it? Is it though? Do you guys know? Or is it document? I forgot. If it is the global object, then you don't need it at all. You can just say. OK. Anyway, you can add this event called the hash change event. And you can, you can pass into this event a callback that will get called every time that hash fragment changes. So this is the callback function. So again, whenever it changes, I'm just going to log it to the console. So if we look at the example again, full screen, and open up the console, if I click on home, it prints out home. Now if I click on about, it prints out about. If I click on home, it prints out home again. So this is how you hook the JavaScript into this navigation. And also, the back button works. So if I click back, it goes back to about, and then it prints out about again. It doesn't refresh the page. But um, 
this is just to point out that when you change the fragment, it does not refresh the page, but it does add an entry to the history of the browser. So the back and forward buttons still work. And you can also send a link to somebody. You know, so if I copy and paste this URL and then open it again, and hit enter, open up the console, I see that home has been printed. This is because I logged the initial value. So this is how you can uh, implement what's called deep linking sometimes, sometimes called deep linking. You can link to something within the page. So this is how you can use uh, location.hash and the hash change event. Like just the basics of the usage. So in this next example, we're going to mix this idea of the hash fragment with dynamic content. So if I click on home, now it, it puts that home in the page. Rather than printing it to the console, it puts it in the page. So I can click these different links, and then it changes this content in the page. And the way this works is there's now a div with ID content on the page. And then, oh, and also the JavaScript is separated into a separate file with this script tag here. And this is the only thing that the JavaScript does. It, uh, it adds that event listener for hash change. And this gets called every time the hash value changes. And then it gets a reference to that div using document.getElementById. This is the same thing as the jQuery syntax that looks like this. Selecting the content div with the content ID. And then it's just setting the inner HTML of that div to be the location.hash value. So with this code, we get this behavior. And again, the back button and forward button should still work. But what we want to do is look up uh, the content of each of these pages based on this identifier, based on this name that changes. And one thing I want to point out is this does not handle the initial value. So I click on the contact page. Here I am on the contact page. But then if I copy and paste this URL and then load the page, it doesn't put content in the page. This is because the code is only responding to the changes. You know, it's only in the event listener, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't read the initial value. So when you use this hash value, you need to be aware, it, be careful about not just using the event listener and not just using the initial value. You need to account for both of these. So in this next example, uh, a function is introduced called navigate. Function navigate. And it's the same code as before. Uh, it will get the content div and then set its inner HTML to the location.hash value. But uh, now it's called once in the beginning when the page loads. This is to get the initial value. And then it's called again every time the hash change event gets fired. And notice how when this code runs, um, the function is, de is defined after it's used. And this works in JavaScript because of a concept called hoisting. Hoisting will uh, make it so that this it's as though there's a var declaration at the top. It's like as though the function were defined at the top of the file. Something to be aware of in JavaScript is called hoisting. Yeah, question? If you were just doing navigate, could you put place navigate as your callback function instead of using like function over? Yeah, that's a good question. That's so funny that you mentioned that. So his comment was, because this function right here is just calling navigate, could you pass in a reference to navigate instead? And uh, yes, in fact, you can. So here's the, this next example. So it's cleaning up the code. Um, navigate is now defined first before it's used, just for readability purposes. And in the event listener, you can just pass the function name as the callback. So when you're using callback functions, you don't need to declare it in line, although you can. And that's how it's used usually. But 
uh, you can just pass in functions. If you have a, a reference to them by name, you could just pass it in like that. And also, I want to point out that this, this code, uh, when it runs, it executes the function right away. And the function calls document.getElementById. So that element has to be there when the code runs. And this, uh, you can handle it with like a jQuery on document ready sort of structure. Or you could just put the script tag at the end of the body. So originally, I had the script tag in the head. And then when it runs, it'll break. Like it won't work because, because the uh, div won't be there yet. It evaluates, rem remember, the browser evaluates the head first completely and then evaluates the body. Um, so if you put the script at the end of the body, that will ensure that this div will get created before the script runs. So this is our basic uh, page, but notice when you first load it, there's nothing there. You're not even on any of the pages. When you first load it without any hash value, see if I load it full screen, you know, you're not on any of the pages. But, you know, logically speaking, if you load this page and don't give it a hash fragment, it should default to one of the pages, right? Maybe the home page. So we need to account for this behavior in our code. So this next example defaults to home. It's just these few lines here that are new. So if there's no location.hash, and by the way, location.hash is the empty string if there's no value for it. And in JavaScript, the empty string evaluates to falsy. There's a concept of truthy and falsy in JavaScript. That means like things that are falsy will evaluate to uh, false in an if you put if you put them in an if expression. So if oh so empty string is falsy and any string that's not the empty string is truthy. It'll it'll evaluate to true. So that means if there's no string in the location hash, then set the location dot hash to be equal to home. And this is how you set the hash value programmatically also. You know, you can, you can add a link, a href equals, you know, hash symbol something. That's one way to set it, but you can also set it programmatically using this syntax, location.hash equals something. But you have to include that hash character also. So that will set that up before navigate gets called. So now the behavior is we're on the home page even before we click anything. So this is how you default to a certain page when you load it. Uh, this next example removes the hash character. So now if I, if I click home, it just says home here. If I click about, it just says about. And this is kind of useful for just cleaning up that string. So you can use it as like an ID to look up something like a file. So what we're going to do eventually is have one file per page. We're going we're to have a home.html, an about.html, but they will just be partial HTML pages, uh, HTML fragments is a, a common term for that. It means there's no HTML tag. There's no body. There's no head tag. It's just that little part of the HTML that will be put into the content div for each page. But anyway, this is how you remove that character. Just use the substring. So the fragment ID is location.hash.substr with an argument of one. So the substr function, oops. Here's the documentation for the substr function uh, in MDN, Mozilla Developer Network. This is like the best JavaScript documentation that's out there, in my opinion. So just for your information, if you're wondering how to use a function that's built into the browser, just Google it. And in the first few Google results will be a page on this site. And that's the page that I would go to. Not like this is often better than the W3 schools examples. So, substr, you give it a start and an optionally a length argument. 
So if you give it substr and an argument of one, that will just remove the first character. I mean, it'll return a string that has the first character removed from the original string. So we, we get the fragment ID by using substr, and then we set the inner HTML to be that fragment ID. So now the behavior is like this. It's just about home contact. This is all kind of in preparation for loading one page per navigation link. So this next step is encapsulating the content retrieval. So here a function is introduced called get content. So instead of just passing the fragment ID, you know, setting the fragment ID to be the inner HTML, a function is introduced called get content. It really doesn't do anything. It just returns the value that was passed in. I just want to show you the step-by-step -step process. So we're calling get content with the fragment ID and it's just returning the fragment ID. But this gives us a space to implement our more complicated stuff that will get the content for that particular fragment ID. So in the next example, we use a JavaScript object that's on the page, that's in the JavaScript code. So check out the behavior. Like if I click on the home page, it says this is the home page. If I click on about, it says this is the about page. So where is it getting all this stuff from? So now the only stuff that's changed is in the get content function. So there's a variable here called partials, which is just a JavaScript object, you know, key value pairs. And the key, the keys of this object are the, the fragment identifier values without the hash symbol. And the value, the values are just text. And these could, this could contain HTML tags, but it just is really simple right now. So this line of code here, it looks up the partial HTML page given the fragment ID. So fragment ID might be one of these three values, home, about, and contact. And if you're not familiar with this square bracket syntax, um, you can put in here like home. And this line of code here is exactly the same as this code using the dot notation. So if you use dot, the key is, uh, it doesn't need to be quoted. And it's, it's, it's like a property of the object. So it's called like property access, property name access. But if that property name, you store it in a variable, like you want it dynamic, you can use this notation and then put a variable in here, like fragment ID. So this will look up the partial HTML for that particular fragment in the object using the square bracket notation. So it works. I mean, we have basic navigation working. So notice, though, that when we click on these pages, it used to, in the version with separate pages, because we used the active class, it used to highlight uh, the active link at, with a gray uh, border. But it doesn't do that right now because we haven't dealt with that. We haven't dealt with the active class. So this next example, it deals with that. It sets the active class. So if I click on about, now this about has a, has a, a gray border around it. And if I click contact, then the contact has a gray border around it. And this is kind of a large chunk of code that I just put in there. So in the navigate function, the last thing it does is it calls this new function that's been created called set active link. And it passes in the fragment ID, which would be home, about, or contact. And I'll just walk through this function. So what the function does is it gets, an, gets access to the navbar div. And again, this is the navbar div. It has these three children that are, that are A elements, that are links. So as an overview, what this function does is it gets access to the navigation bar div, and then it loops through all of the links. And then it gets the href attribute out of that tag, of each tag. And uh, it uses the substring to get rid of the hash symbol that's in the link. So it gets, it gets these values out of here. 
and then it compares each one to the uh, fragment ID that gets passed into the function. And if it matches, then it sets the active class on that, on that link. But if it doesn't match, then it removes any class that might have been there before. So this doesn't do anything if, if it wasn't active before, but if it, if it was active before, then this will remove the active class. So I'll just go through the code in detail, just so it's clear in case there are certain parts that are not clear. So the fragment ID is passed in as an argument, which is a string, could be home, about, or contact. Get access to the navbar div using get element by ID, passing in navbar. That gives you a reference to the DOM element that contains those three links as children. And, and this line of code uses the dot children property of the DOM. So this is part of the DOM API. Yeah, question? Can you use the attribute selector instead? Uh, yes, you can. And that's actually something I thought of after I made all the code examples. But yeah, you could do that. So instead of using dot children here, you could use document dot query selector all. And then you can pass in a, a CSS selector here, space A. And this will actually do the same thing as the other code. So the code could actually be changed to be this. And uh, query selector all is uh, a really amazing function that pretty much makes jQuery obsolete in many ways. Like uh, the core usage of jQuery is for the selector. So you can easily write these selector statements in your code to get at particular DOM elements. But with this query selector all function, which is built into the browser, to the DOM, uh, it does that. So you can use this, this function uh, and pass in any kind of uh, complicated CSS selectors, and it will give you all the, the DOM elements that match. Yeah? So I mean, is you could replace the whole for loop below if you had a selector that only picked things with href attributes that match the substring. You could replace the for loop? Yeah. Doesn't the for loop just check every every link to see if it has the correct href? Well, so what the for loop is doing is it's inspecting each link, each A tag, and then it's looking at the href attribute and comparing it to the page name. And it's changing the, the active class based on if it's the currently active page or not. So I think you still need the for loop. Like you need to look at each individual one uh, and turn it on or off. You know? Can you turn off all all navigation links and then just select the one with the correct href? Ah, uh, okay, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. So his his idea was can you turn off the classes for all of them and then just select the one that has the matching href? I believe you could. But do you know the selector syntax for that? It's like you put it in brackets, you'd say href equals. Oh, cool. Is it like? Yeah. Well, I'm looking for the href that's equal to the fragment ID. Build the string. Yeah, yeah, I could build the string. That's right. So I think that's the syntax, and then add the fragment ID. Like that. Something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, that should be possible. That's another way to do it. Yeah, yeah, there's many different ways to implement this. And this is just one. But yeah, there are many different ways to do it, many approaches for this. And this is just how I came up with it, you know, using just the DOM API. And with jQuery, it would become cleaner, shorter syntax, you know, less code. But this just sets the active link, active class on the links. Now what we want to do is we want to move from having the content inside the JavaScript code to having the content in separate files that are loaded asynchronously, not synchronously. So right now it synchronously gets the content. So this get, get content function, it returns a value, you know? And this 
structure of a function is called synchronous. This is a synchronous function. It returns synchronously. It returns right away. But if we fetch something from a file, it'll have to be made into an asynchronous function that uses a callback instead. So this next example, the only change in this example is the structure of the code is made asynchronous. Nothing in the code really changed except the the synchronous versus asynchronous structure. So this is how you write a function that takes a callback. So this function get content takes a fragment ID and also takes a callback function that will get called at some time in the future or right now with the content for that fragment ID. And instead of returning partials at fragment ID, it will call the callback with that value. And then in the calling code, in the code that calls that function, I want to show you what it was before. So in the version that just returns it, in the navigate function, it just says content dot inner HTML uh, content div dot inner HTML equals get content of fragment ID. Because it returns a value you can just set it equal to. But if it's asynchronous, you need to change it around a little bit. So in the asynchronous version, it calls get content, it passes in a fragment ID, and then it passes in a callback function that could be invoked now or later usually later if it's asynchronous. Um, and that argument to that callback function is the content. So before the content was just returned from the function, but now it's passed into the callback. And then inside the function, this code assigns inner HTML to be content. So again, it, it calls the callback with the content. So this is making, fu making functions from synchronous to asynchronous. I'll just look at it once more. So here's the old version, get content. It returns a value. This is the synchronous version. And here's the, the asynchronous version. It takes a callback as an argument, and then it calls the callback with the value. And in this case, it gets called right away. I just want to show you the step-by-step -step process. So this is making the structure asynchronous, getting ready to really make it asynchronous using XML HTTP request. In this next example, we actually fetch the content from different files using XML HTTP request. So here is the get content function now. It creates an XML HTTP request, and then it opens the request. So this kind of initializes the request, gives it the information it needs to, to, to get sent. With XML HTTP requests, there are a few different steps. There's the open step that initializes it, and then there's the send step that like finalizes it, sends it off. So open, uh, the first argument is get, meaning it will be an HTTP get request. There's a few different kinds of HTTP requests, get, post, delete. And then this is the path of the file, and it's a string that is constructed based on the fragment ID. So fragment ID might be home, for example. So if it's home, then the path will be home.html or about.html. And it will, it will fetch that file. And then request.onload, this, the this is the function that gets invoked once the, the file is loaded. And you can get at the file content, the text, with a request.response text. So once it's loaded, this get content function calls the callback that was passed into it with the, with the content. And again, in the navigate function, the callback is this function here that just sets the inner HTML of the content div to the loaded content from the file. Can you go up a little bit? Yeah. So that uh, request, that response text, that's, that'll be the HTML of the page that was loaded? Exactly, yeah. Request.response text will be the HTML text in the file that was loaded. Yeah, question? So the request on the is not a block that and that we're going to go as soon as the request is returned. That's right, it's not blocking. It's not uh, synchronous. If it were if it were synchronous, it would be block Syncing, synchronous and blocking are kind of the same meaning. Yeah, but it's an it's non blocking. 
So what this does, it says request.onload equals a function. And this is setting the pro it's it's another way of using callbacks. So rather than passing the callback into a function, it uh, sets the onload property of the of the request object and then the request just it's just the way that the API is set up XML HTTP request but yeah when you call get content all this stuff executes and then the get content function returns it doesn't return anything but it 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 has sent the request so this frees up your page to do other things so like other JavaScript could be running while this request is is going across the wire and getting processed and then comes back later. Yeah. So, so you said something that you're setting a property. Yet. So it's not like an event to do all those. You're setting a property of request objects, which will then invoke points on the request. Yeah. So the question is, you're set, you're not you're not adding an event listener. You're setting a property. So let me actually look at this on load. So with the with the DOM API, it has in it uh, this recurring pattern of one way to set up the callback, like to set up the event listener, is to assign a property that's similar to, to the event name. And I think onload may actually be an event. So I think you may be able to use like request.add event listener onload and then pass it the callback. I think there, there might be these two different alternative ways. Uh, let me just look it up. I'm not sure. Here we go. Okay, the first event is W3Schools, but I'm going to look for the other one because it's better. Uh, the Mozilla one. I think this is it. So there's window.onload. Um, I think I need to look at XML HTTP request instead. So I linked to that over here. The onload handler, onload. It's an it is an event handler, yeah. Event handlers. So I think you should be able to uh, use add event listener onload. When you do it this way, you can only add one callback, you know, one of one listener to that event, and that's the disadvantage. But uh, in this case, there is only one listener that we need. So this is one way, request.onload equals the function. But then if you, if, you, if you reassign onload to be another function, then the first function will be like lost. You know, so that's, that's why they have this alternative syntax of add, add event listener. The first argument is the name of the event, and the second argument is the function. I think this would work. I don't know exactly, but uh, that's the general idea, yeah. Yeah. Why would you lose the onload if you <coughs> redefine it as another function that's specific to that particular XML HTTP request? So to illustrate what I mean, let's say uh, I replace it like this. Foo. This code, so this line will set up the callback that we want. Th this these few lines, but then these few lines will replace the onload property with a new function. So it won't call the, yeah, you wouldn't. You wouldn't, but in large scale applications, like let's say you want to add something to window.onload, you know, and your JavaScript code uses window.onload equals your function. But then let's say um, you include another library that also uses the same syntax, window.onload equals. If you load two separate JavaScript libraries that both use window.onload equals something, then the last library that gets loaded will be the only onload event that gets actually called, you know? So that's, that's one danger of using this uh, syntax for events. But in this case, it's really fine because we created this object. You know, we created this XML HTTP request, so there's no possibility of other code adding events to it. But uh, uh, global things like window, you know, when you add events like uh, mouse events, it's better to use the add event listener syntax. Because, so, so that way, code from different sources, different libraries, could add the same events and, and both get called. Yeah. 
And uh, I just want to show you these are the different files. So it's just about.html and it just has these strings. And I want to point out that again, these are partial HTML files, not full HTML files. A lot of people make the mistake when they get into this sort of thing, they make the mistake of including the HTML and not HTML tags in the partial HTML files. And also in PHP, this could happen. So just be aware that the, the partial files should only really be partial. They shouldn't have the body and the head and the HTML tags. So this is pretty much working. So let's see what we have. If I run it full screen, it works, you know, and the 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 hash value is changing and the back button works. And notice when I click the back and forward buttons, everything changes. Like the, the active class gets set and also the content gets set. But uh check this out. You can actually inspect the network activity. So if I go to the network tab over here, if I click on about See, it loads about.html. If I click on home, it loads home.html. If I click on about again, it loads about.html again. So is there anything wrong with this? You guys see any improvement that could be made? Hmm? Caching, yeah, exactly. So we need we need to implement caching. I mean, this is working, but if you were actually on a network, it would, you know, Every time you click on a, on the page that you visited before, it would go out to the network and try to get that page again and again and again. So we don't need we don't need to do that work. But in order to implement caching, we need to write a little more code. And again, libraries provide this for you. But w w if we're not using any libraries, we just need to implement it ourselves. So the first step is encapsulating AJAX. So the code now is just rearranged so that get content calls this other function fetch file which is pretty much the same code as before and this is just a generic version of uh, get http get so this encapsulates an http get request and this is exactly the same as jquery.get pretty much so this way in this get content function we can implement our cache this gives us a, a nice little space to implement our cache So a global variable is introduced for storing the loaded files. And then in the get content function, which is invoked by the navigate function, um, checks the cache. So if, if the cache has that content, if it's been loaded before, just call the callback with the content in that cache object. But if it has not been loaded before, It'll fetch the file, and this is the callback to the fetch function that has the content of the file. So this line of code right here stores it in the cache. Parcels, partials cache at the fragment ID equals content. So this partials cache will really have the same structure as the object we had before. You know, the JavaScript object that we had all typed in in the file? This partials cache will have the same structure but it'll just be dynamically filled in from the HTML files that are loaded. Yeah? What if you need to check if the file's content has changed that way you're not loading really stuff like that? Oh yeah. What if the page content changes? Like what if the about page changes? Uh, yeah, we're not handling that. But that's a good question. Yeah, like in development, if you're developing the actual content and then you refresh the... If you refresh the whole page, then, then you'll get the new content. But if you just navigate, it'll get the cached content. Yeah, so I mean, this is just a, a naive cache that just caches uh, whatever it gets. Yeah, so, but if, if the page content changes and then you navigate back to it, you'll get the old page content. You're right, so it won't really update properly. But if you refresh the page, if you really do a refresh, then you'll get the updated content. Cleaning up the JavaScript. Wrapping it in a self-invoking function so that no global variables are created. Uh, I just want to go over this in case you guys don't really know about it. The structure is like this, where there's a function that gets defined, and then it gets invoked immediately, and it doesn't uh, create any global variables. All the variables are inside of it. And so this, this shape is at the bottom of the file. See, right here. 
so it invokes the function. And now the, the cache variable, this partials cache, is no longer a global variable. So this is just best practice if you're making a JavaScript library not to introduce global variables. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And I wanted to show you also, this is uh, how you could do it using jQuery, using the jQuery syntax. So I've just changed around all the JavaScript to use jQuery instead of the DOM API. And I'll just run through uh, what has changed. So the fetch file function is just replaced by this uh, jQuery.get. jQuery.get does the exact same thing as our implementation of fetch file. So now you kind of know how jQuery.get works. It just makes an XML HTTP request object. I mean, jQuery.get is much more robust. It's, it's a lot more code inside to deal with like browser inconsistencies. But now you get the general idea of how it works. So that fetch file function is just removed. So that eliminates like 15 lines right there. And uh, the caching logic is the same. Here you can implement the set active link in a more concise way a little bit. Um, you know, select using jQuery selectors and using the dot each, which is like a functional for loop that jQuery gives you. And then setting attributes, you know, getting attributes using the jQuery syntax is a little nicer. Um, here, this line just uses the jQuery syntax instead. It's not that much uh, simpler. And this is how you add events to the window using jQuery. So, I mean, it doesn't give you all that much, really, in this case, in this example. Yeah? So how come on the, the very first thing, the global function you're doing, yeah. there's like an outer paren? Can't you just say function something? Right there. Right here? Yeah, why is there like a open paren on the left of that? Yeah, this open paren is a convention so that people, um, when they see this code, will know immediately that this is an immediately invoked function expression. So if I remove this, and I remove this over here, I believe it will still work. When you see this uh, code here, like, it may be a little confusing. Right. Just when you get hit with this, like, whoa, whoa, what is this? A function that doesn't have a name, you know? But, so you're right that you don't really need it, strictly speaking, but, uh, it's better to put it because it's like it's just a convention in JavaScript. Yeah. Oh really? It won't work without those? Let's do a little test. Let's test that right now. So here's a function immediately invoked. It it logs hello, but if I remove the outer parens, will it work? No. Wait. Well, you need those parens to call it. But uh, it looks like you need it then. It looks like you do need it. Yeah. Oh, it forces the function to be an expression rather than a statement. Huh. Cool. Cool. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Good luck.